So I'm really pleased to introduce Manish Aghi. He is a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery. He's a surgeon scientist, and uh, he has um, not only uh, expertise in the care of patients with glioma, but his research also spans how the tumor microenvironment contributes to therapeutic resistance in glioblastoma. Um, he is the PI of several um, surgical trials and um, will share his information and expertise regarding these particular studies. Manish? Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so it's really a, a thrill to be here with you today. I'm going to be talking to you, as was mentioned, about surgically-based trials for gliomas. Um, and I don't have any disclosures. And I'd like to start by just sort of defining what I think are surgically-based trials for glioma, because uh, surgery can be incorporated into trials for its purely for its cytoreductive roles. Um, but what I like to think about in terms of surgically-based trials for glioma is clinical trials in which the surgery serves a greater role than just tumor debulking. And for the purposes of this talk, I've divided this into three categories that I'll be touching on. The first is where the surgery plays a role in deriving biologic information. Uh, the second is where the surgery provides tissue that creates a tissue-derived therapy for the patient. And the third is where the surgeon themselves will administer a therapy as part of the surgery. So starting with the first category, tissue-derived biologic information, what I'm really referring to here is this concept of phase zero window of opportunity trials for glioblastoma. These are typically going to be non-therapeutic first in human studies. They'll involve a small number of patients, typically 10 to 12. And the general concept is that a patient will be given a limited drug exposure prior to surgery, a microdose, um, in, in then pre and post drug tissue biopsies. In the case of glioblastoma, this will be just uh, post drug tissue since we have limited access, but so the concept for glioblastoma is that the patient will get the drug, have serial blood work done in the hours to days before the surgery, and then during the surgery, the tissue will be analyzed for levels of drug along with the blood and um, often the spinal fluid. And then those metrics can give rise to information about PKPD and whether the target itself is being hit, which can lead to a determination as to whether the patient should then go on to the subsequent phase two uh, component of the study. Um, and this is a concept that has been pioneered by numerous groups, most notably Nader Sinai's team at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And here's an example of a study that they published in 2019 of rebociclib, a highly specific orally bioavailable small molecule inhibitor of cyclin-dependent kinases four and six. Uh, they had a phase zero trial that enrolled 12 recurrent glioblastoma patients. The eligibility was that the patient needed intact expression of the retinoblastoma protein with either deletion of CDKN2A or amplification of the target CDK4 or 6. These patients took this drug daily for five days before surgery, and then patients who had favorable PKPD, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic analyses, went on to enroll in the subsequent expansion cohort, as I mentioned earlier. And the findings really illustrate the power of the phase zero trial. They were able to show using the plasma that the drug achieved a pleak plasma concentration three hours after oral administration and was eliminated in a little over 12 hours with steady state concentrations achieved four to five hours after four to five days of daily treatment. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that that's the same thing that's going on in the brain. And thankfully, they were able to analyze CNS kinetics and the spinal fluid, which were similar to blood kinetics with a two to eight hour peak CNS exposure after oral administration. They also resected both non-enhancing and enhancing tumor and confirmed as was hypothesized that enhancing tumor was able to achieve about fourfold more drug concentrations than non-enhancing tumor, which was very informative to those of us who have always speculated that the blood-brain barrier breakdown around regions of enhancement would make it easier to get drugs to those areas. Uh, and then further analysis of the tissue really drove home the key point that you obtain with a phase zero trial, which is that the target was being hit. Of course, very tricky in glioblastoma because you don't have the pre-treatment, the immediate pre-treatment tissue. So you have to compare it to the archived 
tumor at diagnosis, which may um, predate the recurrent resection by some time. Uh, but with that caveat in mind, the levels of phosphorylated RB protein dropped by 50% following the drug exposure, and the proliferation index of the tumor also dropped from about 5 to 3% after the drug exposure. So this is just an example of the first of these three categories of surgically-based trials that I wanted to touch on. The second one is examples where we take the tissue and derive a therapy. And so these are gonna be immunotherapies. These can be either peptide-based where the tissue is combined and, and the example I'll illustrate is with heat shock protein to make it more immunogenic in the form of a peptide-based vaccine. The alternative is to use the tissue to prime and stimulate a cellular vaccine, such as a dendritic cell vaccine. And so those are the two examples I'll touch on. Heat shock protein vaccines are derived when you take heat shock proteins and mix them with tumor derived peptides from the resection, the resected tissue. And these will form a heat shock protein peptide complex that can be administered systemically as a vaccine. And this has been shown to stimulate not just uh, adaptive immunity, but innate immunity as well. Uh, and this was work that was pioneered uh, years ago here at UCSF uh, by my late colleague, Andrew Parza, who uh, went on to lead a three-arm randomized phase two trial using the HSPP696 vaccine. And I won't touch on that in detail other than to say that unfortunately those results were negative, but there is ongoing studies, not just in the US and abroad, as to how we can leverage some of the insights from that trial to sort of uh, improve this concept, whether it be by combining it with systemic immunotherapies is, is one potential way of doing that. I mentioned not just peptide vaccines that can be derived from tumor tissue, but dendritic cell vaccines can also be derived from tumor tissue. Dendritic cells are the antigen presenting cells that are in all of our bodies in our tissues that are in contact with the external environment, the skin, the nose, the lungs, or the gastrointestinal tract, just to name a few. The, uh, and the general concept of a DC vaccine study would be that the dendritic cells will be isolated from the patient's skin and at the, the surgically resected GBM tissue will then be used to derive glioma cell peptides that are used to load the dendritic cells ex vivo and the prime dendritic cells can then be reintroduced into the patient's body systemically uh, and in the hopes that it'll stimulate durable anti-tumor immunity. Uh, to date, results of 10 clinical trials with DC vaccines and glioblastoma patients have been reported. Most of them have used tumor lysate pulse DCs, as I described. Others have used uh, polypeptide or even nucleic acid pulsed DCs. Um, the typical side effect profile is favorable, and most of the side effects are going to be immunologic in nature, such as fever or enlarged lymph nodes. The largest such study to date was a phase three trial of the DC vax uh, concept. Uh, which results were published in 2018, but a little tricky to analyze because the trial had an intent to treat format in which the control arm could get the DC vax upon progression, which makes comparative analyses difficult other than to say that the concept certainly had limited adverse events. And the third area of surgically based clinical trials that I wanted to update you all on is one that I've been very involved in uh, myself at UCSF, as well as um, when I was in training out in the East Coast, which is surgically administered therapies. So this is where the surgeon doesn't just serve the cytoreductive role, but actually administers a therapy uh, at the time of surgery um, that will hopefully provide durable uh, benefit beyond the time of the surgery. So here are some recent examples of what we can administer intratumorally. Uh, folks have done this with protein toxins. The example here is interleukin-4, which allows you to get into the tumor because the GBM has interleukin-4 receptor, can be fused to the pseudomonas exotoxin. This is a concept that MedSena has been trying. Uh, chemotherapies, um, as we've done at UCSF with nanoliposomal CPT-11. So you put the topoisomerase inhibitor into nanoliposomes to allow prolonged uh, durable diffusion over time. Uh, Jeff Bruce's team at Columbia has looked at topo TCAN as a um, target for drug intratumoral drug delivery. Others, numerous others, have looked at viral therapies administered intratumorally. We've all seen and heard about the work from poliovirus coming out of Duke, replicating retrovirus, which was the study of a randomized trial, herpes virus, and adenovirus, which is ongoing activity, including 
uh, from the folks at MD Anderson. And then cellular therapies have also been studied, including adipocytes and neural stem cells, which have been shown to have uh, affinity for tumor cells and be able to migrate within the resection cavity and therefore could serve a useful purpose for delivering therapies themselves. But in my experience, it isn't, it's the, the concept of intratumoral delivery is, is about multiple decisions. One of them is of course, what you administer as shown with this slide, but the other is how you administer it is just as important. And so one option is you can administer the therapy into the cavity walls after performing a surgical resection, uh, much like the nice surgeries that Dr. Harvey Jumper showed with all of their adjuvant technologies. And in this case, the concerns, there's sort of strengths and limitations. The advantage of doing the approach like this is you get the benefit of the cytoreductive surgery before you even inject the therapy. So much like we all like to see a good surgery before we give systemic chemotherapy, a good surgery before you inject intratumoral therapy may also be similarly advantageous. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that infused liquids like to find their way into holes and there is no bigger hole than the resection cavity after a nice surgery. And so it is very tricky to inject infusate into the walls of a resection cavity and to do so in a manner that does not lead to some degree of leakage back into that empty cavity. We could also pursue stereotactic injection of the therapy into the tumor without resection. And of course, the disadvantage then is that you've got a bigger target, but if you have selective enrollment or volume-based therapies where the, the volume of the infusate correlates with the volume of the tumor, you may have a, a way of doing this without resection. So the advantage here is there's no concerns about leaking into the cavity, but you do have to avoid old cavities that might be nearby where you're injecting. And you also have to leave the needle in for a little while to avoid reflux out the tract. And that gets to a key point is that there's two options for stereotactic delivery. One is diffusion-based and the other is convection-enhanced delivery. So the convection-enhanced delivery, which we have become believers in here at UCSF, improves the delivery by using a pressure gradient. So the infusate is hooked to a standard IV pump and delivered over the course of hours. And this allows a larger distribution volume than straightforward needle injection, which relies on diffusion and really allows distribution at centimeters beyond the inoculation site compared to just millimeters with a needle. And CED for GBM has been the subject of 20 published clinical trials since 1997. The techniques have been improved. Improved catheter design has allowed us to improve our volume of distribution relative to our volume of infusion so that we can now infuse the, uh, the therapeutic agent well beyond the enhancement and into the peritumoral flare. And this gets at that issue I alluded to with the phase zero trials of how difficult it is for systemically administered therapies to get to the flare. But now with our improved VD to VI, you can see here an example where the enhancing portion of the tumor is in red, but over the course of hours, we were able to distribute a therapy, in this case, a pseudomonas exotoxin, well beyond the red into this green, which matches what we see with the flare of the tumor. We also have technologies that allow us to really plan our trajectories nicely. So this is really the day before surgery where we're planning to do convection enhanced delivery to the small therapy uh, near the hypothalamus. We identify our entry point. We determine whether we need more than one entry point. And the software tells us what percentage of the tumor will be uh, covered with the infusate, how long we have to infuse. And then uh, I'll flash forward here and show you that even beyond that planning, we have the ability to see on the patient's skull, this patient had a prior craniotomy. One of our needles is going in at the edge, which is fine, and the other is going in behind the craniotomy, but we are staying out of the area of the prior surgery uh, and all of the issues that can arise with that. And we then go from that model uh, to actually doing it on a plastic version where we show where our two catheters are placed. Um, at, this is all done the day before surgery and really designed to minimize um, any unpredictable events that occur at CED. So while CED does not sort of, it's not the same as open surgery, which I do quite frequently, I've learned over the years that it requires just as much forethought and planning to get it right. Uh, and here's just an example of what we've done at UCSF 
as I mentioned earlier, with nanoliposomal CPT11, where we treated 18 patients initially in a standard dose escalating manner, but subsequently we've had six patients treated with volume-based dosing after obtaining FDA approval, where we infuse the amount of, uh, of the drug based on the volume of the tumor. We've treated tumor volumes from two and a half to nearly six cubic centimeters and covered nearly 50 to 90% of the tumor volume with the infusate, which is something we've gotten better at over time. And our cannulas have unraveled infusion rates of up to 50 microliters per minute without reflux. So the standard infusion can occur in a three to four hour window. We've infused one to 10 milliliters to one to two targets per tumor. And our VD to VI ratios, which started on the lower side of one, have now started to approach just shy of three, which allows that distribution beyond the tumor and into the surrounding flare. And although this is really a phase one study, it's met, it has had some encouraging results compared to historical controls with, some, with uh, about nearly three fourths of the patients surviving more than a year after treatment. This is my last sort of slide, which is to show what is the future of convection enhanced drug delivery. Well, you know, much like systemic chemotherapy where patients go into infusion centers to obtain periodic infusion, we know that these drugs target dividing cells and really need the tumor needs multiple exposures to the drug. So Jeff Bruce's group at uh, Columbia is looking at this, this idea of infusions in an outpatient center where you have catheters that are attached to a subcutaneous reservoir and a patient can be reinfused multiple times, at least as long as the MRI show that there is a viable target in the tip of the catheter. And I think this is a logical next step for this technologies as we look to uh, advance this further and further and make improvements for our patients. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that we as neurosurgeons can hopefully play an important role beyond our ability to achieve cytoreductive benefit for patients. And that's through these surgically based clinical trials for gliomas, whether it be the information we obtain about about drug uptake through phase zero trials, our ability to derive tissue-based immunotherapies, or even our ability to administer therapies at the time of surgery. So with that, I thank you for your time, open to questions in the chat, as well as via email at my email address shown here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.